Welcome. Welcome to the second of our Tanner Lectures. I'm Leif Punar, the faculty head of the McCoy Family Center for Ethics in Society. If you were here for our first lecture last night, you may have shared my delight in hearing Tommy Shelby in dialogue with Antony Appia, two of the world's finest philosophers, leading us through an illuminating discussion of stereotypes. Professor Shelby's interlocutor for tonight, Jennifer Hochschild, will bring a different and equally formidable set of skills to the conversation. At Harvard, she is the Henley Labar Jane Professor of Government and Professor of African and African American Studies, as well as a Harvard College professor and a lecturer at Harvard's Kennedy School and the Graduate School of Education. One might sum up Professor Hochschild's extraordinary accomplished career in political science by saying she's done it all and she's won it all, including being president of the American Political Science Association and holding a distinguished chair at the Library of Congress. She works across many areas. Let me give you some sense of her extensive research into race and ethnicity by mentioning just a few titles of her publications, such as Americans' Ad 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 uh, Attitudes to Racial or Genetic Inheritance, Creating a New Racial Order, and Facing Up to the American Dream, Race, Class, and the Soul of a Nation. It's a great honor to have Professor Hochschild with us, and we're very much looking forward to hearing her reflections on the lecture and her views in the one-on-one -on -one discussion that will follow immediately after that. Our Tanner lecturer for 2023 is Professor Tommy Shelby, who is the Caldwell Titscomb Professor in the Department of African and African American Studies and the Department of Philosophy at Harvard. Since Professor Soller gave the formal introduction of Professor Shelby last night, maybe I can share a few more personal thoughts on the importance of Tommy Shelby to philosophy and to America. Professor Shelby's 2006 book was We Who Are Dark, The Philosophical Foundations of Black Solidarity. In his rave review of the book in the New York Times, Orlando Patterson said that, with a few noble exceptions like Professor Appiah's work, philosophical reflections on African-American identity were then a virgin intellectual field, and Patterson praised Shelby for plowing all the fresh ground. Today's superabundant growth of philosophical reflections on African-American identity show how seminal and fruitful Shelby's early book was. Through sheer force of intellect, Professor Shelby helped to create a whole contemporary philosophical genre. What's so distinctive about Professor Shelby's work is the subtlety and the accuracy of its analysis of topics that may seem too tangled to sort and too hot to touch. His 2016 masterpiece, Dark Ghettos, works through many such topics from residential segregation to the obligations of the denizens of dark ghettos to obey the law, to form families, to take whatever jobs are on offer, and to limit the forms of their resistance. Many of us might come to issues like that feeling that we don't even know how to think about them, much less what to think about them. But Shelby teaches us how to think. And because his analyses are so sapient, his conclusions often set our standard for what we should think as well. And I might mention that all of this applies just as much to his excellent recent book, on prison abolition. In my intellectual circles and in my household, Shelby is always referred to with great admiration and in fact with a gratitude that crosses into the theological. He has guided us like Virgil through so many of our perplexing and distressing debates over race in America and we hope that he'll continue to lead us to a better place in our common future. Thank God for Tommy Shelby. It's something that I've heard said and I've said myself so many times in the past few years. 
and we are so grateful to have him here with us tonight. Please help me welcome our 2023 Tanner lecturer, the philosopher, Tommy Shelby. Thank you so much, Life. That was all very kind, way too generous, but I greatly appreciate it. Um, and hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon, and thank you all for being here, especially those of you who came yesterday and came back today. It's, it's a gift. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump, jump right in. <clears throat> So recently, a colleague of mine hosted a workshop on black political thought. There were about a dozen participants, men and women, all of them black, on friendly terms, if not friends. So after the workshop, not uncommon, we all went out for dinner, in this case in Harvard Square. Nice restaurant, loud, large, maybe verging on hip. And as it happens, uh, an entirely white waitstaff. So, you know, we're sitting around, waiting for the bill to come. <clears throat> and I realized that this was actually a perfect opportunity with this group to ask a question that I'd often wondered about. So because there's a stereotype that black people don't tip well, this is something I should take into account when I'm deciding what I'm going to tip. My presumption is that, you know, one should tip, right? um, even if the service is not particularly noteworthy. Right? The question was, how generously in light of a stereotype? And it turned out everybody had an opinion. A lively, at times humorous debate kind of broke out. And so one person said, they just think about the fact that servers are not paid well. And that's it, they don't give any consideration to the stereotype. Another thought that, look, this is a group of black professionals. They're just gonna be regarded as an exception. Doesn't matter whether we tip well or not. It's not gonna have any impact on their broader generalization about black diners. A third, who suspected there might be some truth in the stereotype, said they always tip generously to make up for it. So I start with this story um, as it illustrates the central question of my second lecture, and that is, how should members of a disadvantaged racial group respond to the wrongs of a negative stereotype? Before addressing that question, though, I'm gonna turn to a discussion of a wrong of racial stereotypes that I haven't yet considered, and that is status inequality. So human beings, they want to be viewed in a positive light, to be widely thought to have valuable and praiseworthy traits. One's social status, one's public reputation is constituted by the opinions that other people have of you. Individuals can acquire or lose status based on their personal attributes or the social roles they occupy. And they can also gain or lose status because of the social groups that they belong to. Now, status is a matter of social esteem. It's conferred by others' beliefs and value judgments. Your social status depends on whether others believe that you have an attribute that is an excellence or a shortcoming, a virtue or a vice, a strength or a weakness. The material trait, that is the basis of assessment, it might not be readily um, observable. But a person may possess an easily identifiable proxy trait that is believed to be highly correlated with the more difficult to discern material trait. So racial classification is sometimes treated as a proxy trait rather than a status distinction as such. Now, social status is 
uh, inherently unequal. Can't have high status if nobody has lower status. However, not all status inequalities are unjust or otherwise morally objectionable. A person's or group's status can be warranted or, or uh, unwarranted, depending on whether the material trait is in fact possessed by the person or group, rather than simply say perceived to be, and on whether the attribute is admirable or disreputable. Those who do great things or provide extraordinary service to others, they merit the esteem they often receive. Those who do despicable things or exhibit the worst moral vices cannot reasonably complain if others hold them in low regard. Yet one can object to the social, a social status scheme based on a trait that shouldn't be a basis for distributing esteem, like the color of one's skin. Even where a status hierarchy is not inherently objectionable, those with low status may reasonably object if they think that they're somehow been judged unfairly. Now we might begin to appreciate what's problematic about an unwarranted low social status if we compare it to defamation. So when someone's defamed, they are wrongly exposed to contempt and derision. Whether that's due to malice, recklessness, or mere negligence, the victim's reputation has been unjustifiably lowered. Now, of course, defamation and unjust low status are not the same. Yet I think the interest that warrants protection here is similar. Defamation entails communicating false statements about a person or group that makes them vulnerable to contempt or ridicule. One's not one is not defamed by the mere fact that someone believes something false about you. Negative stereotypes, because widely held, do damage a group's public reputation. The more people that believe the stereotype, the worse the group's reputation. Group members have a common interest in reducing the number of people who endorse the stereotype. Likewise, it's the belief itself, at least when widespread, that is the primary concern behind charges of defamation. The worry here is that about def defamatory statements is mainly, I think, the concern that others will come to accept a false belief, leaving you with the burden of clearing your name. Demographic generalizations that suggest that a group is deficient in some important way, for example, with respect to basic human capacities or moral virtue, these threaten the group's public reputation and so harm its members' basic interest. In a market society where many valuable social benefits are acquired through competition, such attributions can greatly disadvantage the members of disfavored groups. These negative attributions can inhibit their efforts to get employment, education, loans, housing, many other valuable things. It's therefore tempting to think group stereotypes matter only insofar as they affect group members' access to, say, resources or power. But social esteem is something people seek for its own sake. As thinkers such as Rousseau, Hegel, Weber have stressed. For instance, the concern with group reputation goes beyond the worry that one might be denied a valuable social position because of a faulty demographic de generalization. Now, you might acquire such a position, along with the compensation, the power, the prerogatives to go along with it, and yet be widely thought to be an inappropriate person for the role because of deficiencies that are wrongly attributed to you or perhaps to your group. So here you are deprived of the full status that generally accompanies the role that you occupy. This positive regard is something people typically desire, and I think they actually have good reason to want, even if they are not denied the social positions that they seek. Those in such positions often attempt to prove that their, their detractors are wrong. They want to vindicate themselves in a way. And they take, I think, a special pride when they're able to demonstrate that their doubters were wrong. 
Now, grossly unjust practices like slavery and colonialism, segregation, these have created a racial status hierarchy that's really global in scope. Even with these practices now, at least largely abolished, their shameful legacy remains. This legacy includes the menacing remnants of what was once a more robust status hierarchy. This legacy includes the menacing remnants, these rem sorry, um, th this racial status inequality is sustained in part by racial stereotypes. It's not just that racial stereotypes are like a causal contributor to status inequality. I think the stereotypes are partly constitutive of some group status. Again, a group's social status, just like an individual status, is determined by what others in the community think. When a positive or negative assessment is widely held and stable, this can be said to constitute the group's informal social rank, its relative social position. Because of the prevalence of negative stereotypes, some racialized groups continue to have a low place in a social status hierarchy. Now, this is obviously undesirable, and for many reasons. Some of these reasons have to do with how social status affects the distribution of resources, power, and opportunities. Social status also affects whether people are eager or reluctant to form social bonds with you. For example, as co-citizens, as comrades, as neighbors, as friends. And the lack of general social esteem is itself hurtful and can damage self-esteem. People of color thus have strong reasons to dismantle fully the race-based social status hierarchy that exists, to engage in collective resistance to it. And this, I think, means confronting racial stereotypes. By accepting a negative racial stereotype, one is helping to maintain, perhaps unwittingly, an unjust social hierarchy, an insulting scheme of social rank. To avoid complicity, I think one should observe what I've been calling, lecture last time, the political ethics of belief. It's one thing when the negative judgment is impartial, informed, and well-considered. We're not morally forbidden from forming uh, unflattering opinion about groups, even if these groups happen to be disadvantaged. It is quite another when the judgment is biased, when it's ignorant, when it's ill-considered. I think a functioning democracy, a society of equals, needs more than democratic institutions and fair elections. It needs a, a kind of democratic ethos, a political culture in which citizens take their responsibility for collective self-governance seriously. This ethos should include the political ethics of belief, where citizens are conscientious and epistemically responsible about how they form and update their beliefs about matters of public concern. If we're to have a true society of equals, then the existing racial status hierarchy, this has to be fully demolished. And this is going to require, among other things, active resistance to stereotyping. Though we can't morally demand that people disbelieve certain propositions, I think we can reasonably expect them to honor the political ethics of belief and thereby to make a strong effort to avoid believing damaging falsehoods about their fellow citizens. Faced with an enduring status hierarchy, with black people at or at least near the bottom, a question naturally arises about the kinds of resistance that are appropriate to the problem. It's not realistic to expect negative black stereotypes to disappear on their own. They're not just going to evaporate with time. There are people who benefit from existing racial status inequality, and so it appears, are invested in maintaining it. Or at least, they don't appear to be motivated to reconsider the stereotypes that they hold. So is there anything that black people can do, and should do, about this circumstance? Now, in earlier historical eras, there's always been a critical mass of black people working collectively and individually to improve the group's public image and its self-image against degrading stereotypes. This was a central element of the political project sometimes called group uplift. People of diverse political philosophies supported it. There are two distinct aims. The primary effort was to enhance black people's public reputation and thereby increase the group's social standing. 
This will be, a, if you like, an outward facing initiative, one aimed at changing the negative opinions others have about black people's traits and tendencies. It's a kind of counter propaganda effort, if you like, meant to undermine prevailing stereotypes and to shift public opinion toward a more positive and accurate assessment of black people. The second aim was about repairing the group's self conception, convincing blacks themselves that they are intelligent beautiful, generally worthy of high esteem, was a core aspect of the Uplift project. There was a sense that some black people suffered from an inferiority complex, or they lacked pride in their group because they had come to accept long-standing black stereotypes. Here, the practical concern about stereotypes isn't about repairing the group's public image. It's about making sure that black people don't come to internalize the negative stereotypes. The two claims can, of course, I'm sorry, the two aims can, of course, be combined and often are. That is, black people can work together to combat stereotypes about their group, and they can cooperate to improve the group's self image by working to get black people themselves to reject the stereotypes. Indeed, the two efforts seem naturally to go together. Negative uh, public reputation can erode black pride. It's difficult to maintain pride in a group that has so little social esteem. Personal self-esteem can be negatively impacted by the low social status of one's group. One can be worried that the group's reputation will denigrate one's own personal reputation, and this too can lower self-esteem. Now, in more recent years, these two aims of group uplift have in some ways come apart. In particular, the first aspect of the project, repairing or improving the group's public image, is now widely rejected, at least in some quarters. Though the aim of cultivating black self-love is still regarded as worthwhile, being concerned with what white people think of black people is seen, by some at least, as a sign of deficient self-respect, a morally perverse posture, a politics that's skewed toward black elite interest, a form of self-alienation, and ultimately futile. Now, I take seriously these and other objections to a form of black resistance that centers on reforming black people's public reputation. And I'm going to discuss them at length, as you'll see. But first, what I do is offer a kind of qualified defense of both aims of group uplift, a defense that is informed by what I've been calling the political ethics of belief. Many have held that the appropriate response to racial stereotypes is simply to debunk them, to demonstrate that the relevant demographic generalizations are false. For example, Ida B. Wells, deeply concerned about the stereotype that black men are disposed to rape white women, used statistics and investigative reporting to show that the belief had no merit. This is what some people call ideology critique, which works by a critical analysis of the stereotypes. The approach uses science and logic to show that the relevant belief system is misleading at best. And through this distortion, it often serves oppressive ends. A behavioral change on the part of the oppressor isn't really called for in this case. Just work by, say, the broader intelligentsia to show that these negative representations aren't justified by the available evidence. If effective, if, effect, if effective, ideology critique would reduce the power of negative black stereotypes and thereby erode an unjust status hierarchy. Now, some proponents of black resistance to stereotypes would simply stop here. Discredit the stigmatizing ideas with research and inform criticism. Yet, a complementary effort would inform, or perhaps remind, put a, uh, potential stereotypers that the group is internally diverse, that black people come in all many, many varieties, including along the dimensions that negative, stereo, ne negative black stereotypes tend to target. Intelligence, work ethic, sexual morality, parental responsibility, violence, and so on. The key is to show that even if some racial generalizations capture something real about group differences, reasoning from group generalizations to individual characteristics is almost always invalid, leading to inaccurate conclusions. Here, collective resistance would be a matter of like educating the broader public. 
it wouldn't be limited to like formal education, right? But would extend to other kinds of programs for the general public using a variety of media. It would be a, a broad campaign to promote a positive and accurate image of black people. There is, however, a serious limitation in this two-prong approach, I think. So many, maybe even most people would need, that, who need to hear these kinds of messages, they're not going to really be exposed to their lessons. They tend to form and update their beliefs based largely on their personal observations and impressions of black people that they encounter, rather than, say, reading a deeply reported news story or looking at a documentary or going to an African American museum. Everyday interracial interaction is often their primary source of information. And so a general practice, <clears throat> excuse me, and so a general practice of avoiding conduct that might lend credence to a negative stereotype could be an important form of black resistance to unjust status inequality. This kind of resistance asks black people to be attentive to how their outward behavior and discernible attitudes could be construed as supporting negative stereotypes and thereby justifying um, their low social status. The need to be concerned about reinforcing negative stereotypes through individual conduct is a recognition of the power of confirmation bias. People are inclined to cling to their existing beliefs and to favor information that supports these beliefs. In a more just world, where a truly democratic ethos reign, people would make a concerted effort to avoid um, and correct for this kind of confirmation bias and to stay informed about critical matters of public concern. This, of course, is not the situation that black people currently face. So the persisting ills of, say, ghetto poverty includes disproportionate crime, incarceration, joblessness, low educational attainment, and so on. These sorts of phenomena will feed confirmation bias and reinforce negative black stereotypes. Counter stereotypic conduct is then meant to remind a person inclined to stereotype that irrelevant generalization has limited, if any, value. So take the stereotype that blacks are prone to crime. And this is probably, I think, the most harmful stereotype that black people now confront particularly given the problems of mass incarceration, the threat of, of lethal police violence. So let's set aside um, whether blacks have a general obligation to comply with the law simply because it's the law. And let's allow that law breaking can sometimes be a legitimate mode of political dissent, even when it's uncivil. It's natural to conclude that blacks should nonetheless avoid confirming the black criminality stereotype, because such confirmation is only going to reinforce the stereotype and thereby buttress a racial status hierarchy. And of course, many black people resent black criminal behavior because they think it makes black people vulnerable to greater suspicion and can lead to state or sometimes private violence against innocent people. Now, might those inclined to commit crimes have a, a duty, a kind of responsibility to other blacks to refrain from doing so to, say, to reduce the hold of the stereotype. So the mode of political resistance I'm going to talk about that I've been describing here, let's call it counter stereotype resistance, it says yes. So let's take the three prong approach to resistance to stereotypes as a kind of package. So you got debunk and criticize black stereotypes. Educate the public about what black people are really like, perhaps with an emphasis on demonstrating black heterogeneity, and consciously engage in counter stereotypic personal conduct. What can this kind of practice of group uplift realistically hope to achieve? Well, at a minimum, I think it could disrupt the easy acceptance of negative black stereotypes by provoking or encouraging people, including black people, to reconsider these beliefs. Given media misinformation and bias, it might also correct a public record about the virtues and vices, the strengths and weaknesses of a historically oppressed group, and thereby remove the excuse of ignorance. It could advance a rival counter image of the group with the hope that it will ultimately supplant the negative public image. 
At its most ambitious, this mode of resistance aims to effectively refute black stereotypes so that, at least eventually, few will be inclined to take such denigrating generalizations seriously. Although I've been discussing counter-stereotype resistance in relation to black stereotypes and black political traditions, I should note that it is applicable to, and it's often been used by, other low-status or otherwise marginalized groups, such as Native Americans, Latinx people, women, members of the LGBTQ community, and so on. And I think similar challenges to the ones I'm going to discuss now arise for these groups as well. There are aspects of counter-stereotype resistance that are also part of what some call respectability politics. Now, I'm not going to offer an interpretation of respectability politics. Politics this is a, obviously a contested idea. It's got many variants, some more defensible than others. I will, however, attempt to show that the political ethics that I'm advocating here is not vulnerable to some well-known and I think quite powerful critiques of respectability politics. Some myths about black people suggest that they lack the basic capacities for equal citizenship. And when I suggest that black people should resist negative stereotypes, I don't mean that they should see themselves as somehow proving that they deserve basic recognition, respect as persons, or that they are entitled to civic equality. Stereotypes that suggest that blacks are not persons, these are demeaning, contrary to the civic reciprocity that justice requires. A person's basic civil rights should not depend on proving that they're somehow worthy of them. Indeed, insofar as disadvantaged groups are expected to conform to, say, heteronormative requirements or so-called mainstream standards for decorum, uh, for, uh, comportment, or dress in order to somehow to receive the equal treatment and protection of the law, I think there's going to be a good reason to resist these demands and perhaps even to openly defy them. We shouldn't yield to these unreasonable demands for social conformity, I would insist. What I'm talking about here are stereotypes that claim, for example, that blacks are deficient in ability and character compared, say, to whites or Asians, whether we're talking about intelligence or work ethic, law-abidingness, parental responsibility, and so on. These alleged deficiencies don't call into question black personhood or qualifications for equal citizenship. Nevertheless, these unfavorable generalizations, left unchecked, can lead to discrimination and low social status. The generalizations are not about recognition and respect, but about social esteem. This is the kind of esteem that does have to be earned. We can't expect it as a matter of course, simply in virtue of having, say, rational autonomy or moral agency or citizenship. Here, the disadvantaged group should be, and typically is, concerned that others in their society don't hold it in high regard and might view or treat individual members accordingly. The stereotypes to be resisted are ones that, if true, would in fact be a mark against a group. These are traits and tendencies to be avoided. They're characteristics that one would not and should not want to possess. It's not merely a matter of avoiding a negative perception, which might not be objectively valid, the epistemic flaw here of the stereotype is in thinking that the negative trait is more prevalent among blacks than it in fact is. It's also important to distinguish resistance as deliberate counter-stereotypic personal conduct from self-conscious assimilation to white or so-called mainstream cultural norms. In familiar forms of respectability politics, the two efforts are typically combined. But black people could seek to discredit generalizations about their intelligence, work ethic, or tendency toward violence without abandoning their distinctive cultural folkways or even code switching in mixed company. It's possible to defend and improve the group's public image without endorsing white ways as the best ways. This is possible when the negative stereotypes pick out genuine deficiencies or morally undesirable traits, like low cognitive ability, laziness, criminality, and so on. A stereotype that reflects no more than white ethnocentrism, that's not something to be avoided, at least not on moral grounds. Now, 
One could insist that black people should strive for excellence and cultivate a good character simply for their own sake. These are worthy aspirations in themselves, regardless of reigning stereotypes. Such striving would improve the lives and overall condition of black folk too. That exemplifying these virtues would improve the group's reputation among white people should, some argue, play no part in an individual's reasoning. Pursuing excellence or being a good person because it might convince others to reject black stereotypes is, they say, one thought too many. If you do the things that make you worthy of high esteem, that's all anybody can reasonably expect. Now there's much in this stance I think is absolutely correct. If the group were not being severely harmed by status inequality and discrimination, it would be entirely sound, I think. But that's not the situation black people face. It's a matter of political reality. Black people cannot expect to receive the social esteem they deserve simply by possessing mer meritorious traits. In fact, some behavior and attitudes that are not intrinsically bad are sometimes regarded as evidence that supports a negative stereotype. For instance, imperfect proxies for cognitive ability, like grades or school attainment or standardized test scores, these are interpreted as evidence of low black intelligence. Conspicuous idleness and persistent joblessness, these are sometimes regarded as evidence of a poor work ethic. A quick temper is received as evidence of violent tendencies and so on. Avoiding these proxy uh, behaviors and attitudes, while not always valuable in themselves, could weaken existing stereotypes and thereby destabilize the racial status hierarchy. Now, I entirely agree that the intrinsic value of a good moral character and other praiseworthy traits is sufficient reason to strive for them. I think it would be perverse to cultivate virtues merely to garner pra praise and approval. Yet this position, I think, is compatible with an effort to highlight that blacks possess these traits, to make it a more prominent part of the public record. Blacks, through their own personal conduct, would also be drawing others' attention, including other black people, to disconfirming evidence. For example, some might seize opportunities not only to be hardworking, but to make it known, make it visible, noticeable that one is hardworking. When this practice exists on a large enough scale, then this could shift the salience of contrary evidence, making it harder to ignore. Criticism that's often lodged, lodged against respectability politics, and I think it might seem to apply to counter-stereotypic, counter-stereotype resistance, is that it reflects a problematic class politics. That is, it only benefits the more privileged members of the stereotype group. The practice of counter-stereotype resistance cast itself as a form of group uplift from which all black people could benefit. Yet, some say it is an opportunistic strategy to gain differential status for the most upperly mobile members of the group, while ostracizing or marginalizing the most disadvantaged members, or even blaming them for the group's continued bad reputation. At its worst, it involves policing and punishing disadvantaged members in the group, sometimes even using the power of the state to keep them in line so that they don't embarrass the more privileged members. Now, this problem for counter-stereotype resistance comes into focus when we consider the nature of the stereotypes that black people currently face. So with categorical stereotypes, all A's or F, a single counterexample will be enough to falsify it. All we have to do is say, hey, look at Du Bois, look at Toni Morrison, that, that should take care of it. The task of refutation, of refutation is considerably more challenging with probabilistic generalizations. Here, the vast majority of A's or F, or most A's or F. And today, it's, it's commonly understood that a significant number of those in the group do not have the characteristics that elicit contempt or pity. This well-known fact does not make the demographic, demographic generalizations invalid or inaccurate. And unfortunately, some of the worst off in the U.S. black population, here again, I used the example of the ghetto poor, exhibit traits and tendencies 
such as low educational attainment, joblessness, or criminal behavior, that might seem to lend evidentiary support to some black stereotypes, effectively feeding confirmation bias. The black professional managerial class, on the other hand, can more readily avoid exhibiting such characteristics. Its members have an interest in avoiding the inference that they are among those who possess the negative traits in question. For self-serving reasons, some might be inclined to highlight how they are outliers, they're exceptions to the generalization. Their counter-stereotype typic conduct could be no more than a strategy to make it visible that they are not one of those Negroes, the bad ones, you know, the ones to be avoided and held in contempt. This circumstances can and has put black people at odds with one another. For instance, the term ghetto, when it's used as a, uh, uh, by blacks as an epithet, can, I think, reflect their class bias and their desire to differentiate themselves from a more stigmatized subgroup. Considering this problem, the question arises, is there any way to disconfirm or discredit a group stereotype in one's personal conduct without being viewed as an exception to the generalization, as an outlier and therefore not a refutation of the stereotype? It's also unclear how, in practice at least, we distinguish counter-stereotypic conduct that is done for solidaristic and justice-promoting reasons from such conduct that is merely self-serving and individualistic. Now, when I reflect on this, I think that we just have to concede that in the short term, the most advantaged in the black population have more to gain from counter-stereotype resistance than the most disadvantaged. I think we also have to concede that some black people are going to participate in bad faith, and mainly for their own personal gain. I think all forms of solidarity run the risk of some free riding on the collective effort. Neither concession, however, I think is a fatal flaw in this form of resistance to stereotypes. So let's keep a couple things in mind. So we have to keep in mind that the strategy of counter-stereotypic personal conduct can be effective only if it's done on a, on a large scale, a critical mass, people have to take it up. The status hierarchy is not going to be meaningfully challenged if only a few people participate. It's fundamentally a collective mode of resistance that depends on most people doing their part. Moreover, its primary objective can only be achieved in the long term because it involves a dramatic shift in public opinion, which tends, unfortunately, to change slowly. Were the public image of black people to significantly improve, this would benefit all in the group, including the truly disadvantaged. Stereotypes that depict black people as dumb, lazy, irresponsible, and violent, these harm everybody in the group. The fact that some black people act counter-stereotypically for bad or disreputable reasons does not undermine the collective goal. The point is to demonstrate publicly in a palpable way that the group stereotype, um, that, that the group stereotype does not hold. Counter-stereotypic conduct, whatever one's motives are for in, in, uh, engaging in it, can still serve this wider purpose. And I think it's absolutely critical that black resistance not limit itself to a general practice of counter-stereotype resistance. Such resistance must also include concerted and determined efforts to improve the material circumstances of the worst off in the group. As I've argued elsewhere, true black liberation is going to mean abolishing the ghetto as a socio-spatial site of oppression, along with the system of mass incarceration with which the ghetto is enmeshed. That's going to require turning to law, to social policy, and ultimately it's about affecting structural transformation. Status inequality is only one aspect of black disadvantage. Finally, I might say to this problem that the problem of internal group division is really another reason to seek to counter a stereotype only when it represents the group as lacking characteristics that it would be independently valuable to have. So displaying markers of class-specific cultural capital in terms of dress, comportment, consumer choices, speech patterns, and so on, these are neither worthwhile in themselves nor necessary, I think, for discrediting 
to stereotypes that matter. A different kind of objection to counter-stereotype resistance is that it is overly concerned with white opinion of black people. I think we can see the force of, of this by reminding ourselves of perhaps the most famous passage in all of black letters. The Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. So taking the lead from Du Bois, some might insist that the project to improve the group's reputation is rooted in a form of self-alienation. The participant is so thoroughly preoccupied with how they are regarded by the dominant group that they don't really have any authentic self-understanding, no self-regard that isn't refracted through the white gaze. The pathology here is feeling good about oneself and one's group only if one is confident that white people would also approve. It's a matter of thinking that a white measuring tape, if you like, is the only valid standard. Now, I think it's certainly possible for black people to be too fixated on white people's assessments of them. It's unhealthy, it's undignified to be solicitive of white esteem just because it comes from white people. However, counter-stereotype persistence, at least as I understand it, is not guilty of either. It can and should reject the idea that there is an imperative to satisfy white people's unreasonable expectations and it can embrace cultural pluralism and tolerance for difference. It's a form of resistance that starts from the premise that many whites accept generalizations about black people that are inaccurate or misleading, and it seeks to correct these mistaken judgments, not to pander to them. And it's just as concerned with the faulty generalizations that some black people accept about their own group. This kind of collective resistance concerns itself with charges that were they true, would in fact justify contempt or low social, low social esteem. Given the nature of the beliefs, it would reflect, I think, a, a lack of self-respect to let these charges stand without rebuttal. There's then a difference between seeking dominant group approbation to enhance self-esteem and defending your group's public reputation in order to eradicate an unjust status hierarchy. Now, among some black people, there's a strong feeling that dignified resistance demands indifference to, or possibly contempt for, white people's negative opinions about black people. We simply shouldn't care, they say, what whites think of us, provided they treat us justly in the words and deeds. And there's something in this sentiment that I admire and share. I think it can be a healthy sign of self-respect. But there is also, I fear, a hint of resignation in this sentiment. We naturally want those we respect to hold us in high regard when we feel that we merit such esteem. Something is lost, I think, when we are wrongly deprived of the good opinion of our peers. Indifference or contempt toward this deprivation could be then <clears throat> mere sour grapes an unconscious psychological defense mechanism that protects the, the self from rejection or devaluation. Now, I think there are a couple of ways that this charge of sour grapes could be answered. And both of these are going to involve establishing that the grapes are, in fact, sour. <laughs> Uh, on the first, what you try to do is you show that the people who accept these stereotypes don't merit black people's respect. Because of their racist attitudes, they forfeit such respect and should be simply ignored or dismissed. One shouldn't want the esteem of a racist. 
On the second response, one demonstrates that the people who accept these stereotypes are deeply ignorant and ill-informed about black people. Whatever judgments they come to, whether negative or even positive, they don't really merit respect or engagement. They're like the random people on, on the Amazon website who give Rawls as a theory of justice a rating of one. Right? They simply lack the relevant background knowledge to make a judgment that's worth considering. There is, I think, a kind of respect that even those who hold racist beliefs are owed, the kind of respect we all, that we owe all others uh, is not a matter, I think, of seeing one another as morally blameless. Rather, we must respect one another as persons, as rational and moral agents. As rational agents, we have the capacity to weigh reasons and evidence and to adjust our beliefs accordingly. As moral agents, we're capable of reflecting on our attitudes and our purposes to see if they are genuinely justifiable to others. Persons can learn. They can show moral growth. So setting aside whether anyone who accepts a black stereotype is a racist, I think there's a difference between fighting a racial stereotype grounded in racial prejudice and fighting a stereotype grounded in failures in the political ethics of belief. So whether the stereotype is merely a rationalization for racial animus, say, as is often the case, Refuting the belief won't generally be sufficient to dislodge the prejudice. Nevertheless, some afflicted with racial, racial prejudice could be led to at least reflect on their hostility, to question its basis, say, if they could be brought to see the flaws in the judgments, judgments they rely on to justify their hostility. Perhaps counter-stereotype resistance could encourage the kind of self-examination that's needed to break free of their irrational prejudice. But sometimes, low regard for a group can follow from mistaken beliefs about the group. Some stereotypes are the result of epistemic errors born of cognitive bias and faulty reliance on heuristics, not irrational hostility toward the group. And Bites might naturally resent, of course, having to correct these epistemic errors, just like many people dislike, say, educating others about black people. Yet attempting to counter these stereotypes, I think, is not undignified. It should be acknowledged that some black people, prone to stereotyping as we all are, tend to view white people as an undifferentiated mass. They don't always appreciate that there are a wide variety of white folk too, who have a range of attitudes toward black people. The political resistance that I'm talking about here will be directed mainly to that segment of the white population that while not having irrational animus toward blacks does have an unflattering opinion of black people based here on their acceptance of faulty demographic generalizations, stereotypes. Some, we may reasonably hope, could be led to change their minds through exposure to counter-stereotypic representations. And it's also worth remembering that many black people hold stereotypes about stigmatized racial groups, including, we should note again, about black people themselves. We should not, I think, regard every person who accepts a racial stereotype as an irredeemable, ignorant bigot, unworthy of our respect and engagement. The question remains whether the effort is worth it. A third response to our sour grapes charge is this. Black people will never acquire the esteem they are due from enough of those who accept racial stereotypes to make the effort worthwhile. No point seeking after such regard. These unfavorable views are widespread, they're entrenched, and so attempting to counter them is a fruitless task. Though there have been some legal gains for blacks, right, and some social economic opportunity now exists, uh, it's much better than under Jim Crow, but the racial status hierarchy is a fixed feature of U.S. society, at least for the foreseeable future. I won't surprise you to know that I'm not entirely convinced of this pessimistic prognosis. 
If survey research is to be believed, the reputation of black people has dramatically improved over the last several decades. Many fewer people accept long-standing stereotypes about blacks, and those who do hold them do so with less confidence than in earlier periods. The young in all racial groups are far less likely to endorse negative racial stereotypes than their older counterparts, as Professor Hope Show and our colleagues have um, shown in a book they wrote together. These facts give me hope that stereotypical beliefs that survive are not completely recalcitrant, that further improvement is possible. Yet I'm not entirely optimistic either. I don't really know what best explains the improvement in racial attitudes that there has been, nor do I know whether the traditional black uplift strategy has been a key explanatory factor in the shift. Even if counter-stereotype resistance did help, I'm not entirely confident that it could bring about yet further improvement. Achieving social progress is, in part, I think, a matter of political faith. Those who struggle for justice can never be assured of victory, and they can't ever be certain that their methods will work. Nonetheless, given what's at stake, in this case, many unfair burdens that blacks continue to shoulder, I think we should at least try. But in insisting on the value of political hope and the contingency of moral progress, I'm not saying that nothing is lost in trying to defeat black stereotypes in the manner that I've been defending. It's simply untrue that all we have to lose are chains. To be specific, those who engage in counter-stereotype resistance, they sacrifice some personal freedom that really should be theirs. The relevant kind of unfreedom is having to adjust one's behavior in response to unjustified judgments that others have about a social group to which you belong. This too can be burdensome. There are things one might like to do and should, in fact, be free to do without stigma. Yet one's inhibited from doing these desirable things because of the potential cost to oneself or one's group. Now, perhaps this is a small price to pay for blacks in the professional managerial class. After all, we already possess many social advantages, even over many whites. And we suffer primarily from downgraded social status relative to others in our uh, class. Things are otherwise, though, for the most disadvantaged in the group. And I think they often have some pretty good excuses for not participating fully in the collective effort. There is, I believe, a, a duty, general duty, to help bring about just social conditions. Everybody has that duty. Resistance to injustice is morally required, even from the oppressed. Many rightly take great satisfaction, find deep meaning and fighting together with others, others for social justice, even sometimes regarding the collective fight as their primary vocation in life. It is, however, I think unreasonable to expect everyone to treat their life as a mere instrument for effecting social change. We each have only one life to lead, and I think we're entitled to try to find some joy in it, to exercise some personal freedom in pursuing ends and developing relationships that we find intrinsically satisfying. And I don't mean here merely that we're entitled to, say, rest and cathartic release so that we can return to the struggle refreshed. Not everybody's going to find it intrinsically satisfying to resist injustice. And this, I think, should not be regarded as a blameworthy failure. In addition to low social status, poor and working class people carry immense economic burdens. They have limited political power and they confront enormous constraints on their freedom. Securing even limited fulfillment in their work or daily lives can be a challenge. And the immediate prospects for escaping these great disadvantages are dim. But as more, they face the intractable difficulty of finding reliable allies among other working class people and among the black elite. Racial stereotypes, as we've seen, are obstacles to such solidarity. Yet the stereotypes can't be significantly weakened without structural transformation, which will require exactly the kind of solidarity that's so difficult to cultivate and sustain. So in these circumstances, it's understandable, I think, why so many deeply disadvantaged black people refuse to participate 
and counter stereotype resistance and instead prioritize personal freedom and enjoyment. So racial stereotypes remain a serious social problem, an unjust burden on those subject to them. The moral grounds for objecting to such stereotypes are many. They can be objectionable not only for their predictable negative social consequences and the wrongful actions that are taken on their basis, but also because of how they are formed, how they are used, how they are held, what they reveal about the character and sentiments of those who hold them, the unjust status and equality that they constitute, and their demeaning propositional content. Racial stereotypes persist in part because many fail to observe the political ethics of belief. Robust fidelity to these norms, an ethos of civic responsibility regarding how we form and update our beliefs about matters of public concern, is, I think, a requirement of a truly democratic society. Black people and other groups have a tradition of response to these epistemic, these moral and democratic failures, counter stereotype resistance. It is, admittedly, a practice that carries real dangers and costs. But its faults are sometimes exaggerated by critics, and its point, I think, not always well understood. Despite the limits and uncertain prospects of counter-stereotype resistance, I continue to think it has a valuable place in the political ethics of resistance, even as I recognize that for some, it's simply too much to ask. Thank you. I want to start, first of all, with thanks to these fabulous speakers, people whom I have known and admired and respected and worked with for many, many years. And so it's just a delight to see you here and, and to listen to you guys talk. Um, and I want to thank also our Stanford hosts. I fabulous dinner last night, great questions, good conversations. Uh, so it's just a real pleasure to be here. I came from Berlin, actually, for these meetings. And so I spent a lot of time on planes, and I don't regret a minute of it. So. First thing I want to say is thank you. Uh, second thing I want to say is I'm not a philosopher, OK? And I'm not going to attempt to respond in kind to the comments from uh, Tommy and Anthony. There's no way in the world I can kind of keep up with the level of kind of analytic elegance and sharpness and parsing of important and complicated concepts. I'm a political scientist. Uh, so I'm going to talk like a political scientist, which is to say, how would one go about doing some of what Tommy's talking about? How would one actually seriously, successfully, or at least plausibly successfully, counter the various stereotypes that he has parsed and explained and, and described for us? Um, so I want to give a little bit of, and of course the answer is I don't know. Um, so I'll give my conclusion is, boy, this is really hard, and you know we need to keep working at it. Um, but I want to uh, try to give a little bit of context, a little bit of history a little bit of tiny snippets of evidence that would allow us to actually figure out how the kind of the so what from what Tom and Anthony have been talking about, how we can at least think about that, if not actually come to a resolution. So that's my goal for, for this evening, is to kind of be the political scientist in response to the philosophers. Uh, and there's two things I want to talk about. Um, one is there is, I think, a contradiction in the academic literature but also in actually American history, and maybe that of other countries, between the genuine long-term declines in stereotyping, Tommy mentioned those, and I'm going to give a little bit of evidence against snippets, to suggest that there has been a genuine change, at least in what people say. Um, and the short-term, enormous amount of evidence about the short-term ineffectiveness of trying actually to do that change in how people believe. So something has changed over a long period of time, and it's really, really hard to get people to change their views. So I want to talk about that contradiction. Again, I don't have a resolution, but I want to kind of get us to think about that. Uh, the second point that I want to talk about um, is how to understand and make sense of, and therefore counter, uh, the apparent rise in stereotyping or at least behavior that looks as though it emerges out of stereotyping over, roughly speaking, the last decade. Um, and we all kind of know what's going on in American politics. And I think there's three different explanations for, I, I'm going to call it the Trumpist phenomenon, but I want to make clear that that's 
a shorthand for what I think is a much larger and more complicated and frankly more interesting issue. And so I want to talk about that complication, although I'll use this shorthand because it's got fewer syllables. Uh, I think there are three potential explanations. Uh, one of which is that the Trumpist phenomenon is essentially a resurgence of suppressed, incorrect, stereotypical views that people have held all along and they aren't supposed to say, and now they're kind of allowed to say it. Second possible explanation is, I think, a more conditional, situational, political explanation rather than the psychological one, which is leaders, leadership, authorities, people whom one respects and maybe even trusts, are in a sense giving permission to people at least to express their old views and maybe even to develop new views that they might not have held under a different set of political circumstances. Uh, the third explanation is essentially an economic, not psychological or political, and that it's the search for a scapegoat. Economic conditions are really pretty awful. People are, are inequality is very great, insecurity is very great, manufacturing has disappeared offshore. Who knows whether the world's going to blow up anyway in the next few weeks or months or years? And so you need a scapegoat. And so the search for a scapegoat is what drives stereotypical arguments and therefore behavior. Uh, again, I'm going to say probably I think all three, three of those things are going on, and I, but, but I think the consequences of how to think about the balance has an impact on how we think about responding to, to Tommy's call. Okay, so through, uh, two points. The first is long-term declines in stereotyping butting up against the extraordinary power of motivated reasoning and the tremendous difficulty in actually changing anybody's mind about anything. Um, so snippets of evidence. Uh, about uh, survey data about intelligence. Um, if you go back to the Roper Poll for Public Opinion Research, you find surveys starting in the 1939 from Fortune magazine. Do you think Negroes now have higher, lower, or the same intelligence as white people? Um, this is asked first in 1939 by Fortune. 43% uh, are born with less of the respondents, 43% of respondents say that Negroes are born with less intelligence. Additional 32% say that Negroes have less intelligence, but that's because they have fewer opportunities. Uh, so you're up in the you know, 70 something percentile. Now you, you could worry about the sample composition and all that sort of stuff, but we'll take this essentially as a stipulated fact. Uh, so NORC, NORC, asks the same question as a series of times from the 1940s up through the 1960s. And they try to separate out these two potential explanations. So the question wording is, in general, do you think that Negroes are as intelligent as white people? That is, can they learn just as well if they're given the same education? So they're trying to separate the social explanations for less intelligence, again, scare quotes around all these terms, of course, um, whereas they're genuinely actually less intelligent. Um, and the answer Nort gives, or finds, roughly through the 40s and early 50s, is that about 45% will say, actually, they really are less intelligent. This is not a problem of education. Um, but um, by the time you get up to the 1960s, essentially similar series, you're up in kind of the 80% will say they are not less intelligent. So about maybe 20%. So it's a huge decline from either 70% or 60 or 50, depending on how you think about those very early surveys, to only 20% by the end of the 1970s, 1980s. Now, 20% is not a trivial number, of course, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But this is a very big, I mean, survey research doesn't show those kind of slopes very much for very many questions. So I'm going to stipulate that there was a genuine decline, at least in the expression of stereotyping, and maybe in the actual belief of Negroes having less intelligence. I have to small permit this, is, but I discovered in the process of looking for these data, uh, two of my perhaps favorite questions of all time in survey research, and they relate to stereotyping, so I'm going to kind of sneak them in, sneak them in as, a, as a footnote here. Um, do you think all Negroes are pretty much alike? 40% say yes in 1944. And then they have the wit, which they usually don't in these kind of surveys. Just, do you think all white people are pretty much alike? Which in some ways is a much more interesting question, because almost all respondents are white, of course, in these surveys. 25% say yes. So we, we, there is some white stereotyping by whites, as well as even more, but not overwhelmingly more blacks. So take those questions for what they're worth. I just couldn't re resist reporting them because I thought they were kind of cool. OK, so by the end of the 1960s, uh, the proportion of the 
survey population who are prepared to say that yes, Negroes are fundamentally less intelligent. This isn't merely an issue of social of, of equal opportunity in education has declined from you know roughly 45 percent to roughly 20 percent over a 34 year period. Okay, so that's a big change. Um, it's you know it, it has it starts with a very high base, so there's a lot of room for movement. I mean you can you can worry a lot about kind of the precise argument here, but I'm going to at least stipulate for purposes of, of, of not what I'm going to say next is that that's a real change and it's pretty substantial. Okay, um, we now get to 1990 and Larry Bobo, our colleague, says, well, you know, I don't really believe that stereotypes have disappeared. Um, so he put a series of questions on the general social survey. It's a more subtle question, um, but astonishing set of results. Uh, here are some questions about different groups in society. I'm going to show you a seven-point scale, which the characteristics of, a, of people in a group can be rated. Uh, are, are people in each group tend to be unintelligent or tend to be intelligent? So you're allowed to kind of spread out your answer. It doesn't have to be a uh, categorical yes or no. Um, so on a seven-point scale, I just added up the number, the proportion of people who said four and higher. So either moderately intelligent up to very intelligent, setting aside the unintelligent half of that scale. 91% uh, of whites are deemed to be four to seven on the seven point scale intelligence. So whites are pretty intelligent. Again, this is sample is not entirely white, but it's overwhelmingly so. 85% uh, of Jews who are asked about separately, 78% of Southern whites, so seven Southern whites are even less intelligent than Jews are. 69% of blacks, 64% of Hispanic Americans, uh, again, on a scale of one to seven, so this is four to seven. So again, roughly two thirds of blacks are plausibly intelligent as compared to 90% of whites. But you know, that's a pretty substantial difference. So the point here is that if you ask the question in a slightly more nuanced way, even in the 1990s, and it's repeated in some future years, there's a pretty substantial proportion of the population who, say this, who, who are prepared to overtly and explicitly stereotyping. So the kind of social norms of not saying bad things uh, pretty easily stripped away if you ask the question correctly. Um, OK, so here we have two questions. Um, I have two questions or two possibilities I want to pose against each other. I'm still on my first point, so I'm going to have to go through this a little more quickly. Um, why are there still these stereotypes? Why do we still have a substantial share of the population who are prepared to say that blacks are less intelligent than whites are, even less intelligent than southern whites? Um, and who's willing to give these kind of answers? Um, there's a series of responses to those that Surrey researchers spent a lot of time thinking about. I'm more interested in the slightly more, I think, philosophically and historically interesting question of why the rapid decline from the 1940s to the 1980s, and then essentially the stereotyping kind of got stuck in 1990. Now, again, this is partly just arithmetic because you've got enough room to change if you started at a low rate and so on. Um, but I want to contrast this substantial change that got stuck with the shorter term cross-sectional evidence on the power of motivated reasoning. Tommy has talked about and that, and so is Anthea. And there's reams of research, and I just kind of knock us over the heads a little bit with how powerful this research is on motivated reasoning. Uh, because it challenges, I think, very profoundly the question of whether actual counter-stereotyping resistance can be effective, or at least under what conditions and for whom. OK. Uh, so. Confirmation bias, disconfirmation bias, those are all kind of subsets of motivated reasoning. Um, I'm going to give two examples of how powerful it can be. Um, it, one is it may turn out to be especially powerful motivated reasoning among people who are cognitively most sophisticated. Um, so it's not a matter of kind of misinformation and if just us smart people can kind of teach those less smart people what to think. It's not merely to use the more elegant language, an epistemic mistake. Um, Dan Kahan is a psychologist and law professor at Yale University. He's done this really interesting, very depressing experiment, uh, survey experiment, in which he separates people into ideological camps. So he's looking at the most conservative and the most liberal. And then he gives people a test of scientific knowledge. And it turns out that among ideological people who have strong liberal or conservative ideology, the greater your scientific knowledge on a broad test of scientific understanding, the more you are committed to your views about climate change. 
So highly scientifically trained conservatives are more convinced that climate change does not exist or is not caused by humans than less scientifically educated strong conservatives. Okay. So among conservatives, the more science you know, the more you're convinced that climate change is not existing. It is not a, it's not a problem. It's not caused by humans. Liberals go in the opposite direction. So this is not an issue of sort of lack of knowledge. It's not if you give people more scientific knowledge, they will be more persuaded that climate change is real. In fact, it's the opposite, at least among people who have strong ideologies. It's a very powerful fact. OK, here's my other example. Um, and this has to do with uh, President Trump and COVID. Uh, this piece of research done in 2023. Democrats and Republicans adjusted their perceptions of the pandemic uniformly in response to new information. So they did, you give people new information, they would actually change their views of the effectiveness of treatment of the pandemic uh, during 2021, 2022. But Republicans attributed more responsibility to President Trump when they were exposed to positive information about pandemic response and less responsibility to Trump when they were exposed to negative information. So Trump gets the benefit of the doubt, but he does not get the blame. Democrats do exactly the opposite, almost exactly symmetrically. Um, so Republicans, I mean, so Democrats basically blame Trump and give him no credit. Republicans give Trump credit and give him no blame. There's lots and lots and lots of versions of these kind of, of these examples. The motivated reasoning is just really powerful. Uh, so what do we do about this? So my, this is my question to tell you. How do we resist stereotypes? How is there counter stereotypical stereotyping resistance possible under these conditions of motivated reasoning? Except that we know that it did happen somehow in the past. Somewhere between 1940 and 1980, I think, there were genuine changes. So, so the, we have two kind of historical argument and a contemporary social science argument that roughly seem to contradict each other. Not quite, but you can, you can wind your way through both of them. But I think it's complicated. Um, OK, my second point, which I will try to go through a little more quickly, uh, is what's going on in the last decade, roughly speaking. There are three potential explanations that you know Jews will not replace us in Charlottesville. Uh, carnage among blacks, resistance to in, undocumented immigration. I mean, there's all kinds of examples of, again, what I'm calling the Trumpist phenomenon. Um, three explanations. Uh, one is the return of the repressed, right? The people who have held these stereotypes and these views all along, and just they're now kind of allowed to express them. The second is genuine new learning from a trusted leader. Again, Trump is a trope here, but not uniquely and only or a misplaced uh, scapegoat for economic and personal distress. So there's a psychological explanation, a political explanation, an economic explanation. Um, all right, I'm going to try to skip some of this because I'm speaking a little bit too long. Uh, so the first explanation of longstanding hostility and, ter and, and stereotyping. Um, I, the, the evidence is actually pretty good for this one, which is to say I looked again at survey data on are Muslims, or is the Muslim religion, slight change in wording, um, intrinsically more violent or more prone to violence, or are Muslims more likely to be violent? Again, the Western wording changes a little bit across survey, but basically that's the point. Um, and this rather surprising, and I thought that would rise in the late, um, you know, during the Trump era, because of course the Muslim ban and so on and so forth. Turns out it doesn't. It's just about exactly the same proportion of Americans, roughly speaking, where are my numbers here? Um, 40 to 50 percent of Americans were prepared to say that Muslims are prone to violence. After, this is after 9 11, but it's as late as 2008, 9, 10. So roughly a decade after 9 11. And the numbers don't change through the next decade. So the proportion of Americans who think Muslims are violent or potentially violent is very high, but it's not a Trumpist phenomenon. It happens before and it continues really through his administration. Uh, similarly, are um, undocumented immigrants likely to commit crime or more likely to cause crime in local communities? Uh, the numbers in the 20 to 25 percent range, it's lower, but it really doesn't change over that decade. So there's some evidence, it seems to me, that there is the behavioral expression of stereotyping got more, in some sense, legitimated during the last part of the previous decade. But the underlying stereotypical views actually hadn't changed very much. They've been there all along. That's explanation number one. Explanation number two is leadership 
uh, new leaders or new politically engaged people in response to leadership are essentially taught how to express stereotypes and then perform the behavior that responds to them. Um, so that, for example, you know, tr uh, again, Trump comes down the elevator and says, Mexico is sending us as rapists, uh, um, carnage of the black uh, criminality in the city. There's all kinds of very explicit cues coming from him, but again, not uniquely from him. Uh, this is, it's, we can spend some time by bashing Trump, but it's actually not as interesting as the broader question of kind of political leadership teaching people to express, hold, and legitimate stereotypes and behave in ways consequential to it. So social media, the young radical right, the January 6th, you know, President Trump called us to Washington. I mean, there's again, there's a variety of examples of ways in which leadership itself is in effect teaching, perhaps especially young adults or people who have been disaffiliated, uninvolved in politics more generally, and they suddenly look at their social media or whatever, oh, I, that's how I'm supposed to think about Muslims or undocumented immigrants or some other population about which I didn't have any particular view. Uh, FBI hate crime data are the kind of the clearest example of that. Uh, they've risen steadily from 19, 2012, 2014, where they were actually at the lowest point. Uh, uh, twice as many hate crimes reported to the FBI by 2022 as by, to, by a decade earlier. There are caveats here about whether what kind of crimes are reported, but again, I'm setting those aside for the moment. Uh, Anti-Muslim hate crimes peaked in 2015-17, which is, of course, exactly around the, the, the time of the presidential election. Anti-Semitic hate crimes have had a steady rise since 2015 and have continued to rise even before October 7th. So there's a clear steady rise there. Anti-Black hate crimes are always the highest, but they actually haven't changed very much. They kind of bounce around relatively high. So there's some evidence that leadership has led to higher proportions, higher levels of hate crime among groups which are newly targeted roughly between 2015 and 2020 compared to their targeting earlier than that. Uh, third explanation are bad economic conditions, bad prospects, looking for a scapegoat. Um, the, the best evidence for this actually comes from a book by Arlie Hochschild, who's a relative of mine, but not important at this point. Uh, it, it's what she calls the deep story. And the steep story is sort of, I'm, so I'm a Southern conservative. I'm following the rules. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm standing in line. I'm married. I hold a job. I have a crappy job, but I go to it every day and so on and so forth. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And then all those others are breaking in the line in front of me and taking my place, taking my status, taking my respect, taking my job, taking my money. And all those others are people like undocumented immigrants, blacks who get affirmative action, the spotted owl, so you know these crazy environmentalists who insist on not logging the forests and therefore depriving jobs and so on. So this notion of sort of my life is falling apart for reasons that are not my fault, but they're somebody else's. Uh, the other best example of this very quickly is the deaths of despair from uh, Case and Deaton's research. Uh, deaths by suicide, drug use, and alcohol abuse more than tripled between 1992 and 2017 among middle class white Americans without a bachelor's degree, I, those people who were very harmed by the loss of manufacturing jobs in particular communities, particularly in Appalachia, but not uniquely so. Uh, life expectancy for them, but actually the population as a whole has declined in the last couple of years because deaths and despair have risen so much. Uh, Rice Chetty's work on decline in uh, upward mobility and so on. So there's evidence of so economic loss is real and it's had profound effect on individuals and communities, and it's got to be somebody's fault. OK, um, so final comments. If we think about those three explanations, they imply something quite different about how to engage in counter-stereotype resistance. And that's really what I would kind of get back to and ask Tommy to think about this. Uh, if we think the problem is the return of the repressed, and so we're going to resist the stereotyping that's kind of been there all along, but we now want to, it's now made more explicit. That's kind of direct engagement. That might be kind of Gordon Allport contact. It might be school and work desegregation. Uh, it might be sort of legitimate protest, civil disobedience. It might be desegregation. It might be racial intermarriage. There's kind of a direct relationship between the people who are resisting the stereotyping 
the people who are engaging in it as a way of teaching them, in effect, that they're wrong. If it's the fault of new leaders, that calls for a political response. Get them out of office and get somebody else in. Change social media, resist hate speech, maybe reject hate speech, change leadership. That's a political response. It's not a kind of a engagement with people holding stereotypes. It's political resistance. Quite different answer. If it's the fault of the underlying economic conditions in which people are looking for skateboards, then you change the economic conditions. And you know, it would be nice to change the leadership, and it would be nice to have direct engagement. But the core problem is the economy, which is being treated as, or which is not being treated. The real problem is the economy, not the scapegoats. OK, I'm going to stop there, because I've gone over my time, and hope that Tommy has some answers, because I don't. Thank you. I didn't talk too long, sorry. First, thanks so much. Those are wonderful comments, super complimentary, I think, to the, to the broader issues we're talking about here. And, and because I, I do want to let people tell me that I'm wrong about everything, so I want to leave some time for that. Uh, I won't, maybe we won't talk, talk for very long, but maybe a, a, make a couple of remarks and ask maybe Please. ask a follow. So I, I agree that the, 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 the big difficult <laughs> question is, Will it work, <laughs> right? So you can, you know, you've got this practice that's been around a long time of counter stereotype resistance, lots of groups engage in it. Um, and so it's a traditional response, right? So you can, you, you could say a similar things about other kinds of social movements, or forms of social protests that have, that have uh, people have engaged in. Sometimes social change has happened they engage in it, social changes happen, but you don't know whether the thing that they did actually brought about the change. So the same can be true here. It could be that, well, yes, people are engaged in this practice and it's got a long history, but you don't know whether it was the thing that really made the, the difference or whether it was something else. So uh, so in a way, I mean, one way of, that I, you know, one could conclude that the, 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 the discussion I was engaged in was mostly about political morality and just kind of think about political morality and the political morality of resistance. Um, which leaves open in some ways the question about what's effective. That's going to be a difficult empirical question, which you're raising like, all the, the difficult questions about how do we know whether this will, will, will work. And I'd also agree that it's, you know, whether it makes sense to do it will depend on, as you say, like what's really happening in these cases, right? Um, like why, why, you know, is it, is it scapegoating? Is it this? I think it will make a difference. The only thought I had about that is it does seem to me, I mean, you presented it in some ways as if, well, well maybe we would, um, you know, other, you know, get people out of office or maybe you just make a change in policy and change economic conditions. And it just seems to me that those things won't happen without like significant interracial solidarity, at least of, of a large segment of the population who can actually put people in office who will be willing to do that, um, uh, you know, or make those kinds of changes. I, so it, there's, there's a way in which like you could, one can imagine that there's a, a, a way that those background changes could happen, even if you thought it was economic or status anxiety that was working. But I just don't see a way to get to that without a significant breakdown in the stereotypes to kind of interfere with those kinds of intergroup, the intergroup solidarity needed to bring about that transformation. So it still seems to me that you, you can't evade the, the need to kind of confront those stereotypes directly in some way. Now, whether the way that I was discussing is the most effective way, I, I don't know. But I, I mostly wanted to respond to the you know, moral objections to it that people often raise that I, th and I think there's some merit to some, of the, to some of those objections and some limitations. So that's mostly what I was focused on. I do, um, one other thought I had was about, um, and in some ways when I first started working on this project, I thought I was gonna write about something else. <laughs> what, I, what I thought I was gonna write about was a problem that kind of comes out of left thinking that says, um, you know, yes, there, is, there are a lot of working class people who hold, you know, perhaps racist, but at least very negative stereotypes about blacks and other uh, stigmatized racialized groups. 
Um, but, you know, they only hold it because, you know, these background things. It's like, it's like, well, the economic conditions are bad for them, the status anxiety and so on, and that's kind of operating and it's leading them to, to do. So I actually wanted to think about whether if, if the conclusion of that analysis, which some people I think do hold, which is that when people of color try to engage in interracial collective action, that they have to come, somehow kind of disregard the fact that people have these views about them. Mm. Like, engage with them anyway, you know, it's, they, don't, you know they, they wouldn't be saying this if it weren't for these other kinds of things. And they're just always seeing to me that that can't be the right answer. <laughs> so, but I, I was going to write about that initially, but, uh, but I got pulled into other kinds of questions about um, which I talked about. Um, one of just about, you know, people talk about economic anxiety, but I'm very interested in status anxiety, which seems to me be operating here kind of strongly. So I think about, you, talk, you mentioned Larry Bobo's work, right? So he, in his, uh, he done a survey research, but he also has a kind of theory about racism and how it operates, right? And he thinks that it's what's going on here is people are reacting to their sense of the group's position, what they think is the appropriate position for the group to have in a, in a hierarchy. So they're not just reacting to their own individual position or their own economic situation, they're reacting to their sense that the group they're part of should be here, but these things are happening and they're dropping down. And then they react negatively to, to that. And that's why and the stereotypes kind of come, come with that. I don't know what the right response is. I mean, I, just, I think it's, a, it's an interesting theory. And he brings a lot of evidence and argument to, to bear on it. But I kind of wondered if, you know, whether you thought, like, if you move, if you did, rather than a kind of more traditional Marxist analysis that focuses on a conception of class that's focused on, um, you know, whether you have capital and whatnot, what's your income and wealth, and focus more on a kind of broadly neo barbarian kind of approach that kind of says, well, that's important, of course, but also people care a lot about their status, in particular in their status of the group, and that can actually be a huge motivating factor in, in politics. And I wonder whether you would think differently about it if you thought that that was operating more yeah. than, than the other. Uh, two comments. Um... One about the status anxiety and one about the earlier question of the need for solidarity. Uh, I'll start with status anxiety because that's on the top of my mind. Um, the problem with status anxiety is what you said a while ago, which is status is genuinely relative. And so working class whites who don't have a college education, whose jobs literally have disappeared offshore or mining, you know, we all now think coal mining is not a good, they are losing status correctly. I mean, their status anxiety is a correct perception of the loss of status compared to what they had, or at least they believed their parents had, especially their father, 20 or 50 or 70 years ago. Uh, President Obama represents an increased status of at least one segment of the black population. So, so Appalachian rights, whites are right. As black status improves, at least on the part of some African-Americans, some whites lose status. It's a zero sum game. If, if it's entirely, I mean, again, I'm being a little bit simplistic here. And of course, I don't mean all blacks. You know, I mean, you gotta be careful about stereotypes and talking about stereotyping, right? Um, so I'm not sure what the right solution to that is. I, I, the solution surely is not reassure whites that their status is just as good as it used to be. And, you know, don't worry about it. Yes, you don't have, a, you know, I mean, the, the solution is, yeah, some blacks are better off economically, educationally, socially, behaviorally, psychologically, whatever, than some whites, you know, deal with it, right? I mean, that's not a good solution either, because the deal with it, of course, is not. So, so I think it's a genuine issue that that is not a an explanation for something. I mean, it, 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 it's not an explanation for something else. It's, it's, it's a problem. I mean, it's a genuine core problem, which is the right problem to have, because it implies that white status is not always higher than black status. And, and that's good. 
but it means it's very, very difficult for the people whose status is declining to figure out what to do with that. And I mean, stereotyping may be the least of the responses. I mean, that may be a better response than many of the other possibilities, right? Yeah. Um, on the other question of uh, uh, your comments earlier that, I'm gonna put my glasses on because I can't read my own notes here, um, about the importance and the necessity for solidarity in response to stereotyping and sort of generally bad behavior. As I was thinking about my three explanations coming at the end, kind of the psychological, political, and economic explanations for stereotyping, it occurred to me while you were talking that you may not actually need to parse the relative importance of each of those three if you have sufficient political solidarity among, you know, as politicians will say, 50% plus, percent plus one of the voters, they get to win. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you might be unhappy about my winning because for economic, political, or psychological, it's tough bananas, I've got 50% plus one of the votes. So, so it seems to me that solidarity is a crucial piece of this story. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, it's not a very philosophically elegant argument, but it's a politically, you know, winning elections get you a lot rather than losing elections. So, so I think solidarity become, you know, back to your work from you know, a long time ago, is, is I'm not sure that what, well, I'm not sure kind of where I'm going with this, but one potential answer is that it's more important to have broad-based solidarity in just enough, which is to say a majority of the right part of the community and they're you know, given congressional districts and all, you know, it gets complicated, but, mm. Crudely put, 50% plus one of the voters need to be solidaristic. And then you don't actually care about why the others hold stereotypes hmm. or even whether they hold stereotypes. Because I would. <laughs> so I, I, I'm just not sure there's a kind of hard edge to the status anxiety piece of this argument and a hard edge to the solidarity piece of this argument, which is not a vision either of myself or of a society that I like very much. You know, winning is better than losing, and that's the answer. Rather than trying to persuade people not to hold stereotypes, the answer is to win the election. If you can, yeah. If you can. <laughs> but well, that's why sort of the, the I mean, the, the polling data, again, you can believe or disbelieve the percent, but it doesn't look as though a majority of whites hold deeply harmful stereotypes, if, if you believe my survey data, mm -hmm. even the more recent stuff. So maybe you can win. So, so maybe the answer is kind of politics rather than persuasion. Mm -hmm. Thanks, I, I'm Thank not sure that. that I intended to get to that answer either. <laughs> <laughs> In some ways, I'd be happy if that's the, if, if that's the case, because the, the case for persuasion seems pretty, pretty uphill. But, uh, well, the case for politics <laughs> isn't all that easy either. But. We'd now like to welcome your questions. As last night, there are microphones here and here. If you have a question, please feel free to get in line since we're going to have to end at 7. Let me encourage you to keep your questions concise and avoid the temptation for follow-ups, please. Thank you, both of you. I'm curious about your Harvard Square tipping example and your colleague who said that as black professionals, maybe we won't, what we do won't matter. If that were true, would it absolve you of the obligation to counter the harmful stereotype? You know, if you can't do anything about it, does it, do you have a responsibility and how should you assess that? Question, question yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I wanna concede, as I sort of said earlier that, you know, that whether it makes sense to do this will depend on whether you have reason to believe it's, it would would be effective, at least if you had enough people willing to participate. And that's also the other part of it, too, is that you, you'd have to believe <clears throat> that, you know, it's not just you and a few of your friends, <laughs> you know, en engaged in. You'd have to believe that there's a broad collective commitment to it so that lots of people were doing the same kind of thing and it would make sense to, to do that. And, but it still would provide, so, you know, you still would have some reason to believe it would make a difference because there are costs to, to doing it. Um, and personal costs that, that I don't people shouldn't otherwise pay those those costs if it's not going to be be effective. But um, actually, that particular case was is not um, 
I don't know what I think about the tipping case itself. That is whether it would make sense to do to do anything differently. Um, if you thought that it's uh, the tipping thing is really a it's a proxy for judging how you know grateful or generous people are, and that that's the thing you're trying to to show is that the stereotype that you know, black people are ungrateful, you know, um, but that's what's going on here, um, then you could see a reason to, you know, try to can, can, um, do something about it. But that might not be the only or maybe the best way of countering the stereotype of being, of being ungrateful. So, I'm not, so on that particular example, I'm mainly using it, I thought it would be, you know, amusing and a good way to start. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't have a strong view of that that's, to, that's a, a, an, a, an important area of resistance. Thank you so much. Uh, I very much appreciate, Tommy, your very careful parsing of, you know, the whole issue of uh, stereotypes. Um, but I wanted to come back to the issue of solidarity. Well, I, I, I'll stick with stereotypes for just a minute. So part of it, what is at stake is whether stereotypes are what are driving the inequality, if that is the basic problem that we need to address if we're concerned about redressing inequity and inequalities. So I don't know that I believe that that's the problem we have to address. I'm a little more concerned actually about the issue of, uh, you know, solidarity and what it means for us to try to have solidarity, which if we're going to have 50% plus one has to expend, extend beyond uh, black people because black people don't, there are not 50% of this um, country's voters. But I'm a little bit more worried, actually, about the stealing of the elections. You know, so as I'm listening to the um, gerrymandering, I'm listening to all these trials, I'm paying attention to the fact that Trump is still enormously popular. And I agree with uh, Professor Hochschild that that's just a phenomenon. It started way before him, and I suspect it will continue afterwards is the possibility that uh, uh, one of our parties, um, not the one that I belong to, will in fact succeed in create, you know, uh, making the US a failed democracy. So that to me is a much larger problem than whether or not we counter stereotypes. So I'm just wondering if that is, uh, how, you, how you think about that. Um, I agree with you. <laughs> I mean, so I, I um... So, you know, how do I think about my vocation in a way? Right? I, I think of myself as, you know, you know since, you know, I um, came to Harvard in 2000 and I've been in the philosophy department and I, I moved to uh, a black studies department um, and a large, big part of the reason I wanted to be there is because he was there and Cornell West was there. Um, and my work was starting to turn and I wanted to kind of go and be where I thought it would be, have lots of interesting colleagues talk about these kinds of things. And I kind of made a commitment that I would you know, turn my attention to bringing philosophical reflection to bear on black life and black thought, and I've, that's what I've kind of done. Um, so this was like another occasion to kind of think about a set of issues um, that are debates within black studies, but that philosophers don't usually talk that much about. So, um, and, and thought maybe I could say something helpful about it. I did not mean by writing about it, that this is the most important issue <laughs> for, for black people or anybody to be focused on. I don't mean to be suggesting that at all. It might be a smaller issue. I think it is an issue and not, not a, a significant one, but I don't mean to be suggesting like this is the thing all our energy should be focused on. And I kind of wanted to emphasize that like, it, it, you should see it as part of a larger set of forms of resistance and, that, that, and some of them are much more critical, right? Um, and in and, my and, and Jennifer, I was just thinking about you know, why you might, you know, worry about this, even if you were thinking about, like, the need for broader structural transformation, you want to win elections, this, this is a critical thing to do, it still seemed to me that you'd have to give some attention to this problem of, like, how we're regarding one another, how people are thinking about groups, and it just seemed like you can't just, like, jump over it. It needs to play a role, even if these things are more significant. So I'd agree with you that these are the bigger these other things are probably more important politically or make a bigger difference to people's life prospects. Um, um, but it did seem to me that this was worth some, some reflection. So. Now, may I make a quick comment mm -hmm. here um, and bring back your discussion of kind of the democratic ethos, so the, 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 the need for 
engagement in serious democratic citizenship. I think it's more than a little idealistic and I'm implausible, not likely to happen. I'm speaking to political scientists. But, but I think these two models, at least two simplified models that are, in, that are part of this conversation. One is effect, in effect persuasion, right? Teach people not to stereotype either because it's a mistake or because it's evil, right? I mean, stereotyping, and through resistance, but essentially behave, you know, sort of it's, it's a let, bring us together kind of model. Um, it's very civilized, it's very, it's democratic persuasion is in effect what you're describing. What I was at least talking about, although I'm not sure it's my own politics, but I got to kind of draw it into it in response to you, is democratic politics is about winning, right? It's about winning under constitutional rules. It's not playing constitutional hardball. It's ensuring that the process of elections and winning and losing allows your opponents to win, have a chance of winning the next time. It's making sure you talk to opponents, not enemies. And so, so it's, got, it's got very clear guidelines, very clear guardrails, as our colleagues Levitsky and Zimbler put. But democratic politics is really about sort of solidarity among the 50% plus one, not trying to persuade the other 49%. So I think we have two quite different models of how to respond to, by the way, as many Republicans think, I was just looking at this survey data on this this morning, 80% of Republicans think that if Democrats win the next election, it's a profound threat to the future of the country. 79% of Democrats think that if Republicans win the next election, it's, so it's symmetrical. Um, so your answer in effect is democratic persuasion. It's, partly, it's resistance. I mean, I don't. I mean, yeah, it's not. Yeah. You know, this is tough. It's not. It, it's it's hard, and people get killed. I mean, you know, I, I I'm not. I don't want to suggest it's kind of hard and soft, but it's a different kind of democratic politics from the persuasion needs to be only enough people to win the election. Yes, and it's probably a different. So I, mean, so I think. That, I mean, I think you're, the stereotype stuff fits into this question of how do we engage with an apparently threatening politics because there's two quite very different strategies for it. I mean, I probably would say. I mean would maybe not characterize it as just a strategic difference, but more a, a, a philosophical difference oh, about agree. what democracy is Yes, uh, I think about. that's absolutely right. So I think... Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to say yeah. merely strategic. No, I yeah. think that's absolutely right. Right, so I think some people think that, except the way you described it, right, what you, that, you know, um, you know, sort of my, you know, dear late friend, Lonnie Guineer, uh, what... I think conceptualize democracy as a matter of kind of fair competition, right? You know, we're competing, see who will win. You just need it to be a fair competition. People, some people shouldn't have like a disproportionate amount of power advantages in that competition, and then and that's what it's about. Like, um, I'm probably more. I'm not like a hardcore deliberative Democrat, but I do think that the legitimacy of law depends on it being rooted in this kind of exchange of reasons yes. between no, citizens. Right. That's, that's, it, it's, that's to, the, to, to legitimize the, the demand that we comply with what the law demands, I think it needs to be rooted in that kind of exchange. So in a way that the challenge we were, ra we were raising is um, about whether motivated reasoning is like so powerful, it's like a, it's like a challenge to that ideal of deliberate democracy, right? And like in that. fact, and, yeah. somehow getting rid of the stereotypes enables a genuine deliberative democracy, I think, in your view. It helps. And, and so it's, it's a, well, yeah, necessary, but not, you know. So, so it's a really profound piece of this threat question. Sorry, yeah, that's the thought. So the people want to talk. Hi. Hello. Um, my question kind of picks up on this discussion. Uh, so towards the end of your talk, you were talking about structure. And one way to think about this problem, uh, I was thinking is, you know, if, if, if all of the institutions were just, but we just had this problem of, the, of ideology, of stereotypes, um, w would, would that be okay? And so I think kind of pushing on the conversation around you know, why exactly or what, what exactly valuable comes out of generating this kind of internal alignment of um, a political ethics of belief. Um, I think some of uh, 
uh, the comments tonight around bringing the political ethics of belief into the political realm and what role it can play instrumentally towards uh, pursuing ends of justice uh, kind of raise a question for me of like, how, how do you think about um, the boundaries between political morality or internal morality and the, re the relationship to justice in the political realm? Um, yeah, so I was just kind of curious if you could talk further about this. Sure, I'll try. Um... I mean, my thought, you know, not everybody thinks this, but, you know, I, I sort of think um, markets are forever. Uh, if you're going to live in mass society, not everybody thinks that. But if they are, um, and that many of the social goods in life are, are going to be sorted by, by, by competition, we hope fair competition, then it, it, it's hard to separate out, like, like, well, if, you know, if we could create the right kind of structures that are, that are just, but then these stereotypes is that I don't think, I don't see how those could go together because it just seems to me that, you know, insofar as the stereotypes are operating, you know, I mean, the, the sorting that happens through this competition depends on people's um, judgments about, about others. Um, and I don't know how you could really bring about the kind of just structure if the stereotypes are powerful and widespread. Um, so I guess I'm not, it's hard for me to imagine the kind of case you're uh, imagining. I mean, you could, you could you know, do the philosopher thing and just kind of say, well, imagine <laughs> that, uh, you know, people had these beliefs, but everybody acted justly. <laughs> you know, um, they didn't let it interfere with their decisions about, you know, who to hire and what their decision is going to be in the jury box. And so they, like, they just hold, they just hold that and just do what they're supposed to do. But that's kind of a philosopher's fiction in a way. And I think in reality, it's like the, those, those judgments are, are, are gonna interfere with the, you know, the just regulation of a, of, a, of a social structure. Even if it were you know, formally just, you still need people <laughs> to make it go. That would be my, I don't know if you have a quick different thought now. Those people weren't cursing. Final quick question and reply, please. It's not the quickest question in the world, but I'll try my best. <laughs> um, I've been listening to James Baldwin lectures for the past couple of weeks pretty obsessively. And I have a short memory, so it was all that I could think of in the course of your lecture. Um, uh, there was a remark in a conversation that he had with Nikki Giovanni that I was reminded of. And I found the transcript online. I'd like to read a paragraph of it to you, if you don't mind. Um, Quickly, please. Not because it doesn't, uh, not because it brings new considerations to the table, but because I think it states pretty powerfully some worries you've already acknowledged. And I'd like to hear more about the conflict on freedom lost. In everybody's protest novel, I was trying for myself to elucidate a theology and the effects of a theology, which I then only realized I carried in myself. You know, it's not the world that was my oppressor, because what the world does to you, if the world does it to you long enough and effectively enough, you begin to do to yourself. You become a collaborator, an accomplice of your own murderers because you believe the same things they do. They think it's important to be white and you think it's important to be white. They think it's a shame to be black and you think it's a shame to be black and you have no corroboration around you of any other sense of life. All the corroboration around you is in terms of the white majority standards so deplorable they frighten you to death. You don't eat watermelon, you get so rigid you can't dance. You can hardly move by the time you're 14. You're always scrubbed and shining, a parody of God knows what, because no white person has ever been as clean as you have been forced to become. And you know you have somehow to begin to break out of all of that and try to become yourself. It's hard for anybody, but it's very hard if you're born black in a white society, hard because you've got to divorce yourself from the standards of that society. Now, it would be a cruel caricature of your view to say, these are the kinds of conduct changes that you're proposing. <laughs> But I think you're at least saying that we have to temper some of the rebellious character of that attitude if we're to take seriously making some changes in light of social standards. And I, I want to understand better how we compare the cost of the freedom lost, you mentioned, even among the most privileged, if what's tied up in the cost is potentially, if Baldwin's right, some threat to self-realization. Uh, if to be black and white society, you have to ignore that society standards. Thanks for reading that. Uh, 
like, 10 reactions to it, but I'm going <laughs> to... Um, no. The first is that I, 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 when you first mentioned it, the, you know, um, everybody's protest novel, I, I like, have a, 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 an aversion to that, <laughs> to, that, to that piece because uh, I'm such a Richard Wright partisan. Um, <laughs> Sort of a tax right in that, and I, I've never kind of like been able to totally forgive all of that. Um, um, but it, um, you know, I do I do take seriously the the, the, the thought that um, where'd you go? Yes, <laughs> um, I do take seriously the thought that there are real costs here. And a part of my discussion was to was to try to say there are some that. It doesn't make sense to see that as part of it, right? It's like, you know, another work I've done, you know, I, it's mostly focused on, you know, defiance and refusal to kind of go along with these expectations, and I not believe those things, right? And in many cases, where these are not legitimate expectations, and it can be uh, uh, a form of, of, of important political protest to 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 refuse to to go along. And some people, I think, and this is like you could think of this as a part of the, at least what oil used to, how much, you know. I'm a hip hop baby, as it were. I right? so, but not of the current iteration. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I when I come into hip hop culture, like it, it expresses the a, a kind of ethos of refusal to, you know, not act in ways that people would think is stereotypical, and sometimes to lean into it in some ways in a kind of defiant way. And I, I think that can be appropriate in certain in certain. Um, on certain conditions. And all of what I was saying was meant to be, you know, philosopher speech, sort of pro tanto duties, right? There can be over, there can be other considerations that override it, right? So it may be the case that it's, it, you know, that it, it doesn't make sense to engage in counter stereotype resistance because these are other considerations, whether you think it, it will be humiliating to do it or whatnot, or whether um, um, there are other forms of protest that may, that might make sense. So I, I, I for instance, I, I think that it can be appropriate for some members of the black population to be defined in the face of laws demands, um, that these are unreasonable demands on them and they have reason, moral reason, to not conform. Though they might have practical reason to conform, it has to do with the fact that they you know, might be locked up, but might have moral reason to, 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 to defy it. So all the things I was suggesting should be Understood in a, you know, as like one set of moral considerations that are going to have to be weighed against others, you know, and these are difficult questions of political judgment, and I didn't mean to try to sort them all here. <laughs> Not that I could if I had all day, um, but I appreciate you raising this question, give me a chance to at least make a, a brief comment about it. Let me invite you all quite warmly to continue the conversation tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock upstairs here, which promises to be quite spectacular. For tonight's abundant feast of reason, let us please thank Tommy Shelby and Jennifer Hudson.